Here's a little building in Ottawa, Canada in 1876. Welcome. Today we're going to talk about the Alaskan World's Fair. We're going to look at a Russian monastery, revisit the London Bridge, and the Garden Palace in Sydney, Australia. But first I wanted to have a little look at this article, and they are recruiting prisoners to bury caskets in New York's Hart Island. And frankly, this seems a little unprofessional. Mass burials in this day and age. Who are the people in these cheap wooden caskets? And how can it be allowed to bury people in this fashion? We're told the prisoners are actually digging the graves, but it doesn't seem to be the case. When we look, we see very old buildings and very suspicious to see a scene like this in the mainstream media. And maybe you know what's really going on. Perhaps there's nothing in these caskets. And this is just a good opportunity to erase some history. And as far as the pandemic itself, I can't help but feel as if this lie can no longer be perpetuated with the rising temperatures and seeming to still be a lack of evidence for shutting down the world's economy. And with that said, Let's look at some history. We're going to start out with this human exhibit. And I'll tell you where we are in a minute. A month-old orphan boy named Ernest was raffled away as a prize. Although a winning ticket was drawn, nobody claimed the prize. The ultimate destiny of the child was still being investigated in 2009. Other human exhibits included displays presenting people from the Philippines, as dog-eating primitive people, the Alaskan Siberian Eskimos, and a Chinese village depicting opium dens. Premature babies were also displayed in French physician Alexander Lyons incubators, decades before such systems were commonplace in hospitals. And here we can have a little look at this baby incubator. And as we've seen before, all these world's fairs displayed these baby incubators, oftentimes with babies included. So where are we? Where would they raffle away an orphan? Here we are in the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. It was a World's Fair held in Seattle in 1909. Here we can have a little look and we can see the column compared to these people and seeming somewhat smaller than say the Chicago World's Fair but seemingly equal in beauty. Godfrey Chilander proposed the idea for the fair. He was then Grand Secretary of the Arctic Brotherhood. He was also involved in the Alaska Territory exhibit in 1905 for the Lewis and Clark Exposition in Portland, Oregon. And here we can have a little look at that just at a glance. Again, not just building these buildings, but these beautiful waterways and bridges. Much more goes into these world's fairs than just buildings. And here we can have a little look at the machinery hull, always having the same designations. And this thing is just amazing. A beautiful panoramic picture for the time and way over the top. Considering this fair lasted about six months, why would you ever build something like this just to use for six months? Absolutely mind-blowing. One of the more remarkable structures I've seen. Clearly some grand palace. Not at all the kind of thing you would build as a temporary structure for a short amount of time. This is perhaps one of the most beautiful buildings designated for a World's Fair. And if the absurdity is not clear in this particular example, then one can only be avoiding the obvious. And here over on the far right side, we see another building, almost seeming overgrown. There's no way one would build a building right on the edge of trees in this fashion. These trees have clearly blown over here and begun to grow along the edge of the building. And when you inherit a building of this grand size who cares about little buildings like this just let them remain overgrown 
and I'm sure the inheritors questioned very little. But maybe I'm wrong. And this brings me to the idea of being wrong. And I once read an article that talked about the idea of how nice it would be to be wrong. And when we consider everything in the world, all the things that are going on, and our preconceived ideas of what may be going on, oftentimes I found that it would be nice to be wrong. And consider the worst thing, and the worst cases in which you are certain that you are right. And oftentimes what we find is that it would actually be nice to be wrong. And what we think is happening may not be exactly what we think. The state legislature endorsed the fair with the proviso that it would produce at least four permanent buildings and that any state monetary contribution would be focused mainly on those buildings. King County, the county in which Seattle is located, stepped up with $300,000 for a forestry exhibit, the largest log cabin ever built, and $78,000 for other exhibits. Design and construction. Here's a look at some of the characters that were involved in the construction. Architects, principal landscape architects, and here's a little look at the manufacturer's building under construction. And as usual, everybody must have had the day off and seeming like a very tidy construction site. Nonetheless, it seems like everything went well without a hiccup and this 378000 was just within budget, and the fair is ready to open in 1909. It would have been ready in 1907, however that proved to be a bad year for the economy, and really remarkable to conceive that this may have been built in a couple years. For who and why, one would certainly never recoup their investment on a fair held for less than six months, certainly not worth the time and energy to build such a city. Not looking like a fairground at all. Attendance. Opening day on June 1st was declared a city holiday and 80,000 people attended. Attendance was even higher on Seattle Day. By the time the fair closed on October 16th, over three million and a half people had visited. And who really attended this fair? Do we see signs of any bustling activity? Perhaps small, unamused looking crowds, seeming like a very privileged class, again, expected to travel here via horse and buggy from all parts of the world, naturally for the World's Fair. And here a little look from the air. And looking very similar to the Vatican with the obelisk and these type of what kind of remind me of crab or scorpion pinchers. And very remarkable. As I mentioned before, much more than buildings. But works of absolute engineering and not something that you would do for a six-month fair in the early 1900s. And next I wanted to show this beautiful building in Russia. So this little nugget was shared with me by Christy, and I thank you for this. This is the flooded belfry, a part of the flooded church and the most eye-catching landmark in Kalyazin. It currently has a population of 13,000 and began as a Settlement for people relieved from paying taxes. Sounds like my kind of people. First appearing in the 12th century, its importance grew significantly with the foundation of a monastery. In the 18th century, the area was included into the Moscow government. It was an administrative division of Russia. The Russian Empire, which existed in 1708, to 1929. The monastery and most of the town were submerged underwater during the construction of a hydroelectric station. This occurred in 1940 and ultimately created a reservoir. After that the town was effectively relocated to a new higher spot. 
very convenient for the residents. And here we can see a remaining cultural heritage monument and the facade crumbling away, revealing the commonplace brickwork found underneath. And this being a great depiction of how the builders of the past may have actually constructed these works of art found all throughout our realm. And here in a deteriorated state, we get a glimpse of how this prior civilization may have constructed everything that we see. And while today, everything we build is cheap and temporary and ultimately disposable, everything left from this old world is designed to last and nothing was done to save a dollar. And very fascinating to imagine this building that was so important to build in this superb way, designed to weather time itself, only to be flooded out and disposed of as a mere landmark. Very tragic and seeming as if the Antiquitec is still hot and let's move on. And once upon a time I found myself in New York City in Times Square and there was a giant billboard as seen here. And I could see it outside my hotel window and thought to myself, what is this? was told that it had something to do with the Olympics and a showing of solidarity for a tragedy, which I won't go into. However, years later, I found myself looking at this and how very similar. And what kind of things do they flash for us all to see that may have different meanings, perhaps some sort of programming, and here reminding me very much of what we see here. And what is the real meaning behind this gesture? And could it be tied to something much older? Something before our time? Very thought-provoking, and just thought I would share. And let's move on. And here I just wanted to touch a little on the London Bridge. I did a full video on the subject, and if you'd like, you can check it out on my other channel. I'll leave the link below. But here I just wanted to touch briefly on this bridge. A fascinating bridge that was apparently moved to Arizona in a small town called Lake Havasu City. And here we're given the story that this was moved block by block from London. And a very impressive bridge built in the style of the old world. And what I proposed in my video is that perhaps it may have been here, simply buried, as most of the old world seems to have been. And this was a nice little article showing this bridge that was supposedly dismantled and rebuilt. And what I liked most about this website was the first photo. What we can see is what seems to be the site of the new bridge, years before the supposed construction. And here's our site. And what we see is something very similar to the ancient grids, similar to the Nazca lines in Peru, that we see all throughout our realm. And often these become repurposed into airports and runways and various other designations. But here in this early photograph, what we see are interesting formations. And if I'm correct, they would eventually cut a channel through this peninsula and build the bridge over it, according to their narrative. And very fascinating. What exactly are we seeing? At the very least, a glimpse of what this area looked like. And again, I encourage you to check out my other video, where I explore this in more depth. And you be the judge. Did they move this bridge? Or was it already here? And here I just wanted to have a little gander at this beautiful, what seems like a World's Fair type building in Sydney, Australia. And this is featured on the Reddit Tartarian Architecture site. Very fascinating posts here. And here what we can see is the Garden Palace in Sydney, Australia. 
built in 1879 and destroyed in a fire in 1882. So here we have a total of three years of usage, a complete loss and waste, and nothing could be more ridiculous. And here we can have another little peek at just how impressive this garden palace really was. And here perhaps some occupants and a true wonder for a very early time period. Here again, the state arch and just exquisite with this obelisk. I'm not really sure what's sticking out here. And how do such things burn? And how are such things built as if they've been mud flooded? Not really making sense with this one, but a true wonder to behold. Enjoyed for a mere three years. And here again, a look from the water's edge. Seeming to be a very permanent and durable structure. However, that means nothing in a world where brick and stone cathedrals and various other structures appear to burn. Entire cities made of brick ultimately left in this condition by fire and completely unbelievable and insulting to even be told such historical lies and I'm constantly questioning what the nature of the force could be that would leave magnificent buildings in this condition and here we have a little comment encouraging us to dig into Montreal Canada and I thank you for the share a lot of interesting sites worth checking out, including the Mount Royal Tunnel and the Golden Square Mile. And we can have a little look at this Golden Square Mile. Very impressive. Buildings built in 1863. And the list just goes on and on. A neighborhood, we're told, and seeming like a very important center for a prior people. Everything seeming to look mud flooded and from an earlier time period. And seldom do we see such a showcase of impressive architecture found within a square mile. And here the Hugh Allen House, simply a residence. And perhaps these were simply homes built for a people discarded in our history. In this particular case, being inherited and here a little look at the inside of the extravagance and everything but ordinary. So that's it for today. I thank you for joining me and do have a blessed day. Please like, comment and subscribe. And here, what is also unusual is how this earth appears to have been piled around this building either before or after it was flooded. And special guest... <laughs> <laughs> what did we say before? Oh, but that... I guess, yeah, you could just say, you could say it like that, or did people build a little island around it before they flooded it, the reservoir? Or is the old photo? Or... Cut. If you ever use that, I would kill you. What? It... If you put me in there, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I really will. In your sleep. And you will not live to be 150. Could this tower have it's been... It's not on. It is. It is? Yeah. Oh, I thought it stopped recording. See, I'm ruining everything already. Ruining the video. <laughs> I mean, is that really... Like, I'm not sure. Like, is that something... I mean, I guess that's just what I find interesting. And I mean, it's like clearly like, to me, I mean, I, I know you don't want to say anything matter of factly, but to me, it's like, no, people did not build a little island around it, you know? Yeah. So it was mud flooded, but how it can't be totally mud flooded because it's only around the building. Otherwise, there would be no lake if the flood level came to that level. You know what I mean? The mud flood level. That's what I'm unsure about. Or, you know, or like did the mud like around the building kind of give it give it something to stick to and a lot of the other mud washed away. Not, I'm not saying put this in there, but I mean, like, I don't know. It's very mysterious. I really don't know. Because it seems like it would be a lot of soil. Yeah. Just... Like this picture. I think we need to show this picture. 
So here we're going to show a little depiction. Wait. Wait, where are we? <laughs> Here's a little depiction of this building and what we may be seeing. If there is dirt up to this level, then it would have to taper off and continue underneath the water. And let's notice this older photograph of the same area and we can see people standing at the bottom of the doorway which appears to be at least 20 feet. So where did this dirt come from? Was it a mud flood? Or was it a byproduct of the flooding of the valley to construct the electric power plant? Not sure? It would be interesting to hear your thoughts.